Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New Hampshire Archaeological Society 2022 Archaeology Month presentations. My name is Mark Dobrowski of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society. In this series, we feature topics on New Hampshire archaeology and around the country by scholars who all have connection to the Granite State. We invite everyone to view our complete presentation schedule at nhas.org and on our Facebook and Instagram pages. This event will be recorded and posted to our YouTube account. If viewers do not wish to be recorded, be sure your camera is off. Tech support for viewers of this presentation is available in the chat or by clicking on webmaster at nhas.org. Today, we are very excited to welcome Tom Martell, who will speak about Hawaiian archaeology. Tom is originally from New Hampshire, attended college at the University of Arizona and University of Hawaii, and has been working as an archaeologist in Hawaii for nearly 20 years. Tom brings a unique perspective in our field, being a trained archaeologist and having Abenaki ancestry. We invite viewers to submit questions via the chat function located to the right on the Zoom screen. Following the presentation, I will gather questions from the chat responses and pose them to the presenter. We will try to get in as many questions as we can, understanding that we might not be able to get to all of them. So without further ado, we welcome Tom, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. Kwai Nido Bak, aloha kako. Uh, hello, uh, friends and colleagues. Um, Thank you for inviting me back again to uh, present. I'm honored to be invited back. And um, last year I presented for the New Hampshire Archaeological Society about a general uh, discussion of Hawaiian archaeology, where I uh, basically covered uh, many topics in very minute detail. And uh, this time I'd like to kind of focus in a little bit more on one of the subjects I talked about. Um, as I was presenting last year, I mentioned a uh, Hawaiian house site and realized that it's a much more elaborate topic. So um, that's what I'll be presenting on today is uh, traditional Hawaiian house sites and settlement patterns. Um, uh, to start off with, we'll go with uh, uh, kind of some general timelines here. Uh, up at the top, I just wanted to compare and contrast it to um, the New Hampshire area to show the relative time frame that humans have been here in Hawaii compared to New Hampshire and northern New England. Uh, you can see there's about a 10,000 year gap uh, there. So we're dealing with a much, uh, much more condensed time frame compared to New Hampshire. Um, and we've, uh, archaeologists and anthropologists have kind of come up with, uh, uh, general categories for these different eras, much like in New Hampshire, where we have, uh, paleo, archaic, and woodland eras, and then going into the post-contact, which is upon contact with Western cultures. Um, they've done the same here in Hawaii as well. Um, these uh, date ranges are general, so we have our initial colonization period where the Polynesians arrived here in Hawaii. Um, it's one of the most isolated landforms in the world, so um, it's quite a feat for them to get here in the first place. Um, they got to the Hawaiian archipelago, most likely from the Marquesan Islands. And uh, we can gather this from various, um, various lines of evidence, such as linguistics and through the analysis of artifacts that have similar forms. Um, beyond this initial colonization period where uh, the people were most likely clustered around the, the near shore environment where you could um, harvest fish and shellfish and other marine resources, which were much more easily obtainable. We go on into the developmental period where you see an evolution of the food production acquisition strategies. 
Um, this is periods marked by the beginning of their agricultural systems. So when the Polynesians came here on their voyaging canoes, they came equipped with all the necessary tools to start a colony. They came with their, their pigs, dogs, chickens for food sources, as well as plant materials like coconuts and bananas. And then there are also the endemic Hawaiian plants that could have been uh, utilized. Um, in this developmental period, this is when the unique Hawaiian culture begins to be developed um, in various forms, such as um, with language and with uh, more distinct artifact forms. Then uh, we get into the expansion period um, marked by increase in population. And for those of you who were here last year, uh, I mentioned the second wave of migration. Uh, most likely, uh, these people came from Samoa or the Society Islands. And um, they brought with them kind of a more rigid uh, political, socio political structure. Along with this, we, we have uh, the in increased agricultural development and the development of loco ia or fish ponds, uh, which were utilized as an aquaculture to gather fish for, um, for eating. Um, one of the main developments here is of the ahupua'a system. We'll talk about a bit more in depth later. Um, basically, uh, socio-political boundaries uh, marked on um, resources, especially based on watersheds and geologic divisions. Um, and as I mentioned, there is uh, much, much more um, rigid control by um, the chiefly system. Then um, the next phase would be the proto-historic where you probably see the maximum Hawaiian population, um, further increases in uh, food production and the development of these uh, systems, including irrigation of the lower valleys and um, into the um, more windward areas, less habitable areas that began to be utilized. Um, much more rigid with the with the um, chiefdoms and everything, and then we get into the, the post-contact or modern era. As you can see, it's roughly the same time as American independence. So um, we're talking hundreds of years as opposed to the Native American experience with their, um, with their contact with Western culture. And these brought about um, dramatic changes to life here in Hawaii uh, with eventually ending up with the uh, illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian government and um, the eventual annexation to the United States and statehood, largely brought about through um, ec by economic means, uh, plant the sugar plantations. And um, now we're in uh, utilized by the military heavily militarized areas and uh, tourism are our two biggest industries nowadays. Here we have um, kind of the visual representation of those periods I just covered, um, the colonization, developmental expansion, and proto-historic. And as you can see, the population is increasing through time. And then the material culture you can see is uh, changing and adapting into these, these uh, uniquely Hawaiian styles. And then we get the, um, the further intensification of these food production uh, systems, whether they be wetland, dry land culture, or uh, fish ponds. Another um, marked increase is in warfare, and that's likely associated with the second wave of migration and the Kapu system, which brought about um, increased uh, stratification of society. Um, to talk about the Ahupua'a system, um, if you envision 
I talked about this last time as well. If you envision an island roughly shaped as a circle, the mountains being the highlands in the center of the island and the ocean at the edges with the lowlands, um, they basically resemble pie slices. Nothing's perfect though. Um, these are associate economic and geological land divisions, often following um, watersheds. And um, for transportation and things like that, it's much easier to follow a single um, stream than to go across these ahupua'a. So you could see how um, each kind of individual slice could be developed and maintained. And each of these ahupua'a um, theoretically hold all of the available resources uh, for life here in Hawaii. You could have the uplands with the hardwoods to develop, to develop tools, uh, canoes, and up there you're more likely to find the fine grain basalt, good for tool making and um, other natural resources and more of the middle lands we could see highlighted on this picture here, you get the, the taro lo'i, they're tapping into the streams and irrigating these various field systems growing their taro. Um, this is uh, really important. This is a staple crop for Hawaiians. And then as you get into the lowlands uh, on the ocean side, that's where you're exploiting the marine resources, the fish, the shellfish, and um, those are much more easily um, acquirable relatively. Um, and each of these ahupua'a could uh, support life and any of the excess materials would have been available for trade or for offerings. And um, for tribute to, um, to uh, chiefs. Um, if you can just look at this, this is just a painting, maybe, I don't know if this is in the way, but um, you can see most of these house sites and settlements are clustered around the shore. Um, the painting looks like there are a lot of grass shacks. You can see some C-shaped uh, structures here, a nice canoe house. Uh, down here we have a fish pond in the lower right, and as you move further, further upland, you can see that the house sites and settlements become a little more sparse. And those are the, the general trends of the movement and the settlement of the people here. Uh, to touch into the ethno history, um, here's uh, three of our most prominent historians of native Hawaiian descent. Um, all of these gentlemen here uh, grew up around the turn of the 1800s, which is just after contact. So they lived at a very um, unique and important period in time for Hawaiians. This is a time transitioning from the tra traditional styles to uh, more Western influenced. And you can see the Western influences just with the little bit of information I've put here. We have um, English names, and you can see from their clothes that they're dressed in Western style dresses. Um, this uh, contrasts a little bit with uh, New Hampshire area ethno historians, where we have the likes of Joseph and Stephen Laurent and um, the Afal Panadi from Odenak, Western Abenakis. Um, when these when these gentlemen were sharing their information on traditional systems, they've already been influenced by Westerners by hundreds of years. And uh, these Hawaiian guys here, um, they're right at that time, but they've, they've obviously been influenced a bit. At the time, they may not have known that they were historians. They were just writers, um, scholars of the time, often associated with schools, and um, they were, I would be, I would say they'd be considered kind of the upper class. They were associated with the kings and the chiefs of the time, often serving as retainers. And when they were making their writings, they were writing in the Hawaiian language. 
And it wasn't until relatively recently that their writings were compiled and translated into English and published for the rest of us who uh, don't speak Hawaiian to be able to access. Um, in regards to their names, how they have those English names, we can see parallels in New England natives uh, from Chief Metacomet being known as King Philip Better and from a New Hampshire native, Kankamagus, who is known as John Hodgkins. So you can see the parallels still between um, New Hampshire and New England natives. In the, in the writings of these historians, they provide um, some really good background information for the discussion we're having with house sites. Um, and they basically talk about the wide range and variation of house sites. Um, David Mallow wrote a bit about um, the differences uh, from, from someone who didn't put much effort into his home. He could have lived in a cave, a hole in the ground, overhanging cliffs, or even the hollow of a tree. But in discussing a uh, more better off upper class person, they would have their, their house, special house for a man to sleep in uh, with his wife and children. Uh, this may be referred to as a Hale Noah with also a number of houses devoted to different kinds of work, um, including one for the wife to do her work. And they even had um, separate structures for, their, for the wife during their menstruation period so they could be isolated. Um, and in that instance, the, the men were not allowed to enter that structure. Um, whether if you were close to the shore, maybe you would have a separate house for your canoe. And also there were typically some kind of religious structures for a household shrine. Um, maybe in most cases, it might be associated with the men's structure and may not be a separate structure. And if you go to the upper class, then perhaps it was a much more elaborate structure. Kalmakau writes um, that houses might be large or small. Um, the upper class typically had um, large establishments with sheds, men's houses, sleeping sheds, heiau houses, which would be a temple or place of worship, a woman's eating house, houses for storage of provisions, houses for cooking, and many others. And as for the the lower class, the commoners, the maka ainana, sometimes they had large or sometimes small houses. And typically each man had several houses for wife, children, parents, and relatives. So you see when I mention a house site, it's not simply just one structure. It's often many structures of, that are interrelated. Um, uh, later, later writers, try to talk about this they talk about the mua or the men's house where the men in, are excluded from the woman and off, often have their ancestral deities uh, worship there the hale noah which would be a common sleeping house uh, hale pea or a woman's hut and uh, hale papa'a storage shed for crops um, and then the separate house the oven shed so most typically, the, help, the foods were cooked in a separate structure. And as a result of the kapu system, um, men and women were not um, allowed to eat together. They're also forbidden from eating cert certain foods. So there, there we kind of have some baseline data to go off of, it's always good to have that heads up of uh, what kind of things to expect. Um, and we're much indebted to these gentlemen. Uh, John Papa E, I didn't mention him yet, but he provided a really good description of King Kamehameha himself's um, royal grounds in Honolulu and all the associated structures and the layout 
from which uh, later scholars were able to make a map basically lining up. I think I shared that last time with the map of the downtown Honolulu area. Also based on his written descriptions of the trail systems, we were able to develop maps that, that show us where the traditional trails were located. And it would be similar to a Chester Price type of a map. And I've had many projects that are in close association with these trails and they're often referenced. So going on to more of a, what is a house? Um, these, these drawings on the bottom are uh, taken from David Mollo's description of a house site. Um, he went into such detail that he was able to name the different types of poles and uh, lattice work that were used in the, in the construction of the house and uh, discuss the tenon and mortise joints for the different rafters. Um, so they're able to develop, develop these quite detailed plans. And um, you can see a difference. Uh, it's a little bit different from a wigwam in that you know these generally had these stone platforms or retaining walls associated with them. So wouldn't be just a post mold, which we would typically find in New Hampshire, New England. Um, and these are a little more squared, although there is evidence that early Hawaiian houses were of a more oval shape. Uh, I haven't had the luck of um, experiencing any of these firsthand though. Um, and this would be the completed uh, reconstruction. Uh, I guess best known as the Bishop Museum Grass House. It was rebuilt inside of the Bishop Museum. We have some general dimensions here. And um, this was touted as being the only authentic Hawaiian hale in existence. The uh, original posts and rafters were gathered from an abandoned house built pre-1800 on Kauai. And then the additional components were gathered from various locations across the Big Island and Kauai as well. And you can see what they look like and you can see some of the associated household goods, uh, these uh, stone ground um, dishes and the calabash. <clears throat> as I mentioned last time here in Hawaii, we don't have pottery that uh, conversely from Native Americans was lost later as opposed to Native Americans was developed later in time. Um, they likely went for these more expedient uh, gourd containers. Um, and an interesting side note, um, just living here in Hawaii so long, you'd be surprised the number of uh, people that come and visit here and think that people still live in grass shacks. Um, definitely not the case as this one is uh, apparently the only one in existence. All right, so uh, here we just have a plan map of a site complex done by an early Hawaiian archeologist, Kenneth Emery, where he um, probably the first map of an entire complex of structures as opposed to a single Hey, our house site. And this um, brings up the question of what is a, what is a house site? Um, beyond that, what is a site even? These terms that I'm just kind of throwing about. Um, I've had in my experiences where the only, the only thing found on a project area is a single emu or a oven feature. And then that in itself becomes a site. Whereas it may just be a component of a site or a complex. So these terms, it's uh, a bit arbitrary, um, broken down as semantics, but um, so I may uh, misspeak occasionally talking about a site, a house site and the such. Um, basically we'll be looking at, um, you know, spatial analysis of these these um, areas and they're often, as archeologists, they're um, 
they're limited to what our study area is, our project area. So break it down from small to large, we may have a sub feature of a feature of a site or a complex or a district. And to me, this map looks kind of like a district more than a complex and certainly more than a single site. So we've got these variations of what we're gonna label these things. Um, in terms of a, a house site, as we heard from the ethnographic reports, um, it could be anything from a hole in the ground to a whole complex of structures. And then we'd have to discuss whether these are temporary, um, semi-permanent or permanent structures. Um, something on the temporary side might be a little C-shaped or L-shaped structure, often um, utilized in very upland areas, isolated, or along these um, arid coastal areas for fishermen often providing just a windbreak, some, something to protect yourself from the elements. Um, in addition to what we might call a house or house site, we also have these workshop areas that would be associated with them. Uh, one of the key aspects of telling what these are is excavation. It's really difficult to tell what exactly we're dealing with when we encounter these without excavation and analysis of the remains. So this is a slide that I shared last year. Um, this is, would be a nearshore uh, house platform. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it with, maybe I'll move that. Um, so you could see um, this uh, faced, um, alignment here. This is a corner here, and this supports a level platform area. The house would have been built right over this, and this kind of would have been the living surface, although um, they would, the Hawaiians wouldn't be just laying on these rocks. Even though they're fairly smooth, um, they would have had multiple layers of uh, played mats and other things to kind of protect themselves. And the plan map that we generated of the site, it may look like this is a boundary wall kind of protecting the site, but it's what actually seems to be more of a bulldozer push pile. If you can see in the background of the picture, it's just all this tall grass, uh, no trees. That's pretty indicative that the area was uh, heavily disturbed in the past and most likely the, the relative pass with the absence of any kind of trees. So this, this house platform, which uh, some of my elder colleagues saw and discussed, and they generally agreed this is one of the best examples they've seen on Oahu. So I felt very privileged to work on this site, um, despite the fact that we could not observe any other associated structures. They likely were bulldozed away um, and that we were not able to do any excavations around this area. Um, that's probably for the better because that shows that we did not have to do any kind of data recovery. This site was slated for um, to be preserved. So basically the project just completely avoided it. So it'll be preserved hopefully for per perpetuity. So unfortunately, yes, we weren't able to gather much additional data on this site. So again, this is more of a near coast um, house platform. And here we have an upland house platform. Um, I think what this highlights the most is how much I procrastinate because I was just here this past weekend um, it's a beautiful site, though. Um, as you can see, the thick vegetation kind of limited um, what I can show in a photograph. These are basically the two, two same sections uh, right here. I hope you can see my cursor is the corner. If you can't see my cursor, the right picture, the lower left-hand side is the corner of the house. And um, 
this large stone to the right of that, you can see in the left background of the left picture. So you can see it's a nicely faced uh, stone alignment and it supports this flat earthen terrace above it that would have had the house site on it. This site, um, while I was working here, it was more of for a protective measure to make sure it wasn't impacted by the activities that were going on nearby. Um, this site was documented previously by the Bishop Museum. They did not do any excavations directly within the site, but nearby there were some strange structures, including an upright stone that uh, made them decide to test that, and they found that it was a burial area. So, so the analysis of this stuff is uh, pretty limited, but this, this site was located on the side of a low ridge, uh, pretty adjacent to a stream tributary that had a number of agricultural terraces associated with it. Um, generally, it it appears based on their analysis that this house site likely dated to the early post-contact era. The agricultural terraces were spanned from the pre-contact era to the post-contact era, but this is a location that's extremely upland. Um, so we wouldn't expect this house site to be terribly old relatively just based off of the uh, expansion and settlement patterns of the native Hawaiians. They had um, uh, much more easily attainable resources closer to their major population centers. But it, it's a beautiful site and I was glad to check this one out. Um, so that those were kind of the near shore and um, upland environments. Now I'll go into a bit more of the social aspects. Um, this plan view here uh, represents more likely a maka ainana or a commoner habitation area. So you can see the platform designated as feature one. It's uh, same thing. It's uh, built on a stone-faced uh, earthen um, terrace. Uh, this one has uh, more of a um, a gravel a gravel pavement or base to it, so it'd be a uh, ili ili is what they call it, and these are water worn stones and provide a nice surface to lay lay on with your mats. Um, you can see the post molds are indicated to the rear of the structure, and to the right of the structure, you can see there's an oven with some more post molds. These, um, these kind of indicate that there was a separate structure here for the cookhouse. So it kind of uh, confirms one of, the, one of the things from the ethnographic documentation. And then if you look to the far rear of the main structure, you can see a separate oven. Um, and this also confirms another aspect of the ethnographic documentation of the uh, se separate cooking area for women as a result of the kapu system. Um, this, this area was also located in an upland area. Um, <clears throat> we, don't see a, we don't see a separate um, temple or religious structure, so it's likely that this one uh, functioned as an uh, informal area within the, or adjacent to the structure itself. Um, go on to the next one. Next aspect of the uh, social is the elite or upper class or even royal habitation complex. So the basic overview left on the left side, we have the entire complex and then on the right side, this is a plan view of the primary residence <coughs> features that are uh, indicated in the lower left of the left one. So the way this was uh, situated is um, this, this uh, complex 
had a commanding view of the irrigated um, lands below that would be down and towards the gulch land and off to the right of these features is going towards this towards the ocean um, so based uh, to find out the status of of the person who may have been living here we have to analyze a number of things um, for one we have very formal um, temple structure which would be up in the the top or the eastern portion of this um, complex map so you've got a, a elaborate separate religious structure it's not just a small little family religious shrine or something and we have these uh, walls extending off of the residence and these basically are serving to kind of uh, se separate into a kapu zone, which would have been off limits generally. To the right, or to the south, we have the men's house, and this also had uh, this one had a low wall surrounding it. And the same thing, this was kind of more of a symbolic uh, separation from the the royalty or the upperclassmen and his retainers, um, just reinforcing that kapu system. Um, also, we have separate burial features indicated here, these uh, burial platforms. Uh, something I forgot to mention earlier was <clears throat> typical in early Hawaiian household sites is people would be buried directly below their house platform. It's been found a number of times, which is just kind of an interesting note, as opposed to here where the burials are clearly separated from their house site. Um, again, uh, to kind of really distinguish whether this is a commoner or upper class type of uh, habitation structure, it's really difficult to do without doing some subsurface testing. So to go back to the, um, to the kind of close up view of the, the house site itself on the right, we can see that we've got the main walls here and these even had these separate cupboard features. And then we have these waves of uh, contours of thickness of cultural deposit. So some of the things that you're really looking for are, would be like the density of um, formal artifacts, um, the presence or absence of non-local stone tools, indicating that you know you've basically got the got the um, economic ability to trade or to be um, gifted these tools from different locales. Um, other indications might be the density of the midden, or for the non-archaeologists, those would basically be what we consider trash deposits. So things like shellfish, um, charcoal, um, animal bones. So if you get if you get a higher density of these uh, status items such as like dog and pig bone, then that might indicate that you're dealing with something on the upper class. Um, another indication too is the setting. So in the previous one, they were located adjacent to some, some uh, agricultural terraces, but um, they weren't like these elaborate systems. Whereas here, these this was, uh, had a commanding view of these really intensive agricultural systems, kind of like an overseer uh, watching over the workers. Um, I think uh, that's about that. Uh, we There were some lithic workshop areas as well, basically showing the different activities that can happen in and around a house site. Um, to go on, I, I had to show at least some kind of artifacts for you guys. Um, this would be a lei niho palaoa. 
uh, otherwise known as a whale tooth pendant. Um, anytime an archaeologist would find one of these, that uh, immediately indicates that this is more of a uh, high class Ali'i type of uh, deposit because these are uh, very special objects shaped from a whale tooth. Um, and it will show the variation in these, uh, these domestic sites. Um, and like I said, it can't really be uh, ascertained without doing subsurface excavations and analysis of these deposits, seeing what these people were doing, what they're eating, what kind of activities were going on at their, at their sites. Um, as far as this one, I'm sure you have all have heard the word lay, just like a flower lay that you would expect to get upon uh, leaving the plane when you enter Hawaii. And then the whale tooth is Niho Palaoa. And we can see a little drawing of one of the archeological findings. And then the cordage could have been from a um, vegetative fiber or oftentimes also a status item like this would have been made a, actually out of human hair. Um, typically that would not survive um, and more only you would find the bottom representation of the whale tooth itself. Um, so that kind of covers a lot of uh, the overview. So as you can see where I very briefly touched on it last year, when I just said a house site, it can be um, analyzed in much greater detail on what exactly is a house site. Um, I'll show you one more example. Uh, this is one of my favorite sites on Oahu. I, I visit here very frequently. This place is known as Kania Kapupu, uh, translate as the Song of the Land Snail, very poetic name. Um, <clears throat> this, this is uh, well known as being the summer residence or summer palace of King Kamehameha III and the Kamehameha dynasty. Um, as you can see, the obvious Western influence on this, this is a post-contact structure. It's a concrete, um, concrete walls and doorways, windows. When it was standing, there's actually no um, drawings or photographs of this when it was in a good condition. This would have had a, a thatched roof to go along with it. But we can see that there are still some of these stylistic elements that um, relate to the traditional Hawaiian times. We've got along the left, you can see um, right at the far left, you can see the corner of this uh, retaining wall, just as similar as what I've been showing you in the previous photos. Um, this pile of rocks here in kind of the left center is the separate uh, cookhouse. And then down here along the lower right, this is a uh, it's uh, not in the greatest condition anymore, but that was kind of a stone lined uh, driveway or walkway type of a thing. Some nearby structures also um, out of the frame of this picture to the lower left, uh, there's some taro loe, which likely date to traditional times. And in the far right background under these trees are some kind of um, ephemeral terraces, likely some kind of garden plots, which uh, may have been another associated feature with the house site is having your family uh, garden plot to support, to support them. Um, this site is kind of unique in that not only does it show, you know, not only the upper class, but the extreme upper class, this was the King's residence, uh, some of a permanent, but also semi-permanent residence as he was typically here in the summer months when it was really hot, you have to get away from the heat of uh, the sun in Waikiki and Honolulu. Um, nearby here, just uh, past this further to the right is a stream with a large waterfall, uh, completely beautiful area. And this is located just upstream from another important site that is uh, loaded with petroglyphs. Another important aspect of this site 
too, is that originally it is thought that this house was built upon a heiau or a religious site type of a temple, um, a very formal one. And it's located kind of on the direct path that would have gone over the poly cliffs from one side of the island to another. So it was a well um, trafficked area. And um, I think that about does it. So I'd like to say mahalo nui, uh, kitsiuliuni, uh, thank you. And I'd like to give a special shout out and thank you to the New Hampshire Archaeological Society, New Hampshire Scrap Program, the Manchester Historic Association, and my colleagues at Cultural Surveys Hawaii, and of course the indigenous people of Hawaii and New Hampshire, New England, who I've had the pleasure to meet and work with. And a special thank you as well to the organizers of Archaeology Month and all of these programs and the presenters. Kisiuliuni, uh, uh, thank you again. Mark, you're muted. That was just a test, seeing if you're paying attention. All right, uh, thank you, Tom, that was great. Uh, we have a number of questions from the audience. Uh, first, oh, are, the archaeological, are the archeological resources distinctive from island to island? Um, typically, they're, they're, um, it varies, but I will say um, there's definitely one outlier and that would be Kauai which is probably the most isolated of the main Hawaiian islands. They, they are known to have a fairly distinct language even. They've got their own kind of, um, um, their own kind of dialect. If you maybe think of like a New Englander versus a Texan or something like that, uh, would be a little bit different, but they have their own kind of artifact forms as well. They have their distinct poi pounders, which I highlighted last year at the end of the presentation on the slides, as opposed to a, like a handle. They had uh, stirrup pounders and um, yeah, different kind of uh, poi pounders are the most striking example. But generally, the Hawaiian Islands are extremely isolated from everywhere else. So they have their own language and own culture, but within the islands themselves, yes, there is a little bit of variation. And I would guess that a lot of this is um, obscured to from the warring periods where, uh, for example, I'm most familiar with stuff here on Oahu, but Oahu has been um, conquered variously by chiefs from Maui and then ultimately by the uh, King Kamehameha as he united all of the islands into a kingdom as opposed to their chiefdom style of living. Great. Um, so thinking of the chipstone uh, tool artifacts, uh, what are the most common lithic raw material types in Hawaii? And then also you had mentioned in your presentation uh, that there, there are um, both uh, local and exotic materials. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Like where are the exotic materials coming from? Are you referring to like another island in the chain? Um, yeah, so um, I think this question came up last year as well. Um, hopefully I've got a bit of a better answer this year. Um, typically the number one source for um, material that especially that survives the archeological record is uh, basalt and um, high grain basalt would have been um, collected from specific areas um, like dikes in the uplands, um, as well as you may have volcanic glass. It's uh, akin to obsidian, but technically it's something different. But um, I've seen um, volcanic glass can be obtained even from a small island offshore, as opposed to like deep in the mountains, like most of these uh, basalt sources. So um, for a couple of examples of these uh, basalt sources, you could get them um, in the uplands here in Oahu. Um, on Big Island, Mauna Kea is probably the most famous um, ads quarry. Again, really, really great material for making tools. 
um, as far as um, materials from different areas um, indicating status, I would suspect it's more from a different island or a, um, a further location from the island as opposed to a really locally procured material. Um, we don't um, try to think if I can think of anything that's not historic, but of like artifacts from different different island chains and um, different areas. We don't have things like a jade that you might get in uh, New Zealand or um, metal that you would get from any of the mainlands. So um, yeah, typically for stone tools, it would be basalt and uh, volcanic glass. The volcanic glass was just like um, the obsidian. It's a great, uh, extremely great for cutting tool. Um, flakes are often found and they're often very small. We typically don't find large chunks of the volcanic glass and rarely even do we find artifacts that are constructed of it. But besides these stone tools, there are um, various other materials. Um, occasionally there's coral, but it could be anything from wood, especially the hard dense woods like koa and um, shell. You could have kind of like a shell. You could make a scraper to scrape the coconut uh, meat, um, things like that. But as far as stone tools, which um, New England New Englanders are most familiar with, it's typically basalt or the vol volcanic glass. Great, that's a great answer, thank you. Um, to what extent do oral histories help inform your work as an archeologist in Hawaii? Um, <clears throat> well, um, luckily, um, you know, it looks more like a brighter future. Um, people are t these days tend to take into account the oral histories much more than previously. Um, for me personally, I've come from a bit of an indigenous perspective, so I might lend a little more credence to that than uh, other, others may. But these days, I think we're very much on board and we listen to the input we have from the native communities. Um, oftentimes we um, find that the, the oral traditions tend to correlate very highly with what we're finding in the archeological record. Um, anything from the resources I mentioned last year with the fish pond analysis based on the ethnographic interviews or analysis of the snails um, coincided quite well with what was said. Um, <clears throat> these ethnographic um, information, these oral traditions, that's where we get these ideas like the second wave of migration, um, Pa'au and the Samoans or society islanders when they come, that would not show up in the archeological record so much as if it's just flat out said to us. Um, one of the thing, one of the best examples I can think of was from my field school working with uh, Dr. Terry Hunt. Um, he worked he worked a lot on Rapa Nui, and he mentioned. Uh, you guys uh, might know it, uh, Easter Island. Uh, the oral tradition told of those idols that, you, you know, I'm talking about the big statues that overlook like the seacoast typically. The oral tradition said that those statues, the Moai, walked to their locations and the initial uh, archaeologists there, Tor Heyerdahl and Others like him are just like, yeah, whatever. Sure, these stone, uh, these stone uh, carvings just walked here by themselves. But when they took into account this and said, hey, maybe uh, we can use this as some real evidence, they did their um, experiments and found that when you tied the ropes to them and wobbled them left and right, they actually kind of walked to their location so um, whether you do take it into account as an archeologist, uh, I'm telling you that you should take it into account, at least consider it. 
Well, that's great. I mean, most of my furniture in my house walks around too. Same. <laughs> um, we have a, we have time for a few more questions. Maybe we'll see, see if we can squeeze two more in here. Um, with the work that you do in archaeology in Hawaii, uh, what percentage is re, is uh, related to Section One Hundred Six, and what percentage is not One Hundred Six? Um, here in Hawaii, I would say the great majority is not associated with Section 106. Um, we have uh, very strict state laws here that uh, protect these uh, natural resources. And um, although they're not perfect, they're far from it. I'm happy that, you know, they protect these sites a bit more than um, what I, my experience is on the mainland. I think um, generally, so if you think about a place like Waikiki, where there's continual development, we know that this was a very important location. It was a location for chiefs, commoners, there are fish ponds, there are streams, there are so many resources here. So we just common sense, we know there's a ton of these archaeological deposits and we're just flat out required to be on site for these development projects. Whereas some, and to use New Hampshire as an example, along the Merrimack River, um, you probably be, you probably be, be more likely to find something than nothing um, anywhere along the river. So the fact that you can just have these full blown developments along the Merrimack with no archaeological oversight, <clears throat> kind of a little bit mind blowing for me coming from Hawaii. Um, but yeah, we do have some section 106 and it's only triggered by having federal monies involved. Um, and that's just kind of a, a difference in the state laws, I would think. But I've worked under both, um, both situations a number of times. Great, and uh, we have about a minute and a half left, so we can maybe squeeze one, one last question in here. Um, regarding the house structures, were the platforms and thatching used primarily to protect from rainfall and moisture? And um, also regarding the, the house structures, um, were, there, were there any... Uh, is there any evidence of fire pits or other such features inside of the actual house structure? Um, yeah, so it's uh, similar to, um, you know, where you would expect a wigwam location in New Hampshire. You'd want it to be high and dry. Um, you know, nobody likes sleeping in a wet bed. So, um, yeah, these uh, plat typically were built up to make a level surface area. The location was important. So for the upland ones that I highlighted, um, unfortunately, I didn't think I showed an aerial map, but they were located upslope from these streams and these uh, um, terrace systems, the low E farm systems that were watered. So they would have been drier. The, typically the mountains are wetter. So yeah, you'd want to have it elevated. Um, the same thing with the near shore, but those are typically on sand, so they're well drained. But yes, you'd also want those to be raised a bit higher. I imagine that's the main reason why they had these things. Um, I don't know that there's an absolute 100% answer to that. Um, in terms of the hearth features, those uh, typically would be outside for these cooking areas. Um, if you have something like a more expedient structure, like I mentioned earlier with the C shapes um, or L shapes, the hearth might be inside and that's because you're a bit more exposed to the elements. Um, in these lowland areas, I could tell you um, if I had a house structure in Waikiki, um, I would not need a hearth inside of my house any time of the year to stay warm. Um, as opposed to the upland structures. Yeah, it gets a bit more colder up there, a bit more cool. There is actually quite a bit of variation in temperature. So you might expect to find some there and that would be maybe more for keeping warm than for um, cooking and processing food, which would have been separate. Um, but yeah, these are generalities. I'm sure you can find examples that go against that. 
Well, that's about all the time we have uh, for tonight. Thank you, Tom, for taking the time to talk with us. We've really enjoyed um, having you here today, and we appreciate your participation in the New Hampshire Archaeological Society Archaeology Month series. 